the Israeli military has released a seven-paragraph statement on why it says that a convoy of aid workers in Gaza was hit by airstrikes on Monday, killing seven people. President Biden expressed outrage over the deaths in a tense call with Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday, which could, could mark a major shift in U.S. policy. More on that in just a second, but we're going to start with Holly Williams. She's in Israel. Holly, good morning. What does this report say? Good morning, Gail. Israel's military has blamed its killing of the seven World Central Kitchen aid workers on operational misjudgment and has expressed its, quote, deep sorrow. It says members of its armed forces were convinced they were hitting Hamas, but they were in violation of standard operating procedures. Israel's military says it wrongly believed that a militant was inside one of the World Central Kitchen vehicles. It says after striking that car, it identified people moving to the second car, which it also hit, and then the third, killing all seven aid workers. The report also found that the Israeli military's cameras failed to detect the markings on the World Central Kitchen vehicles. It confirms in large part the account of the attack given earlier this week by Chef Jose Andres, World Central Kitchen's founder. They were targeted systematically, car by car. Israel also confirmed that World Central Kitchen was coordinating its movement in Gaza with the military. All I can say at the moment is, uh, is to uh, offer my apologies and uh, say that we share in the grief. Despite the deaths of the aid workers, a spokesman for Israel's government insisted yesterday that Israel is setting a, quote, new gold standard in preventing civilian casualties. Yet... President Biden has said that this was not a standalone incident and Israel has not done enough to protect civilians. I mean, is, is, is that a wake-up call for Israel? Our fight is with Hamas, not the people of Gaza, uh, and we will do our utmost to uh, limit civilian casualties on both sides. But the medical aid group Doctors Without Borders said yesterday it does not accept the incident was simply a mistake, claiming it's part of a pattern of deliberate attacks. Humanitarian workers are protected. No ifs, no buts. We do not accept the narrative of regrettable incidents. In a phone call yesterday between President Biden and Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the president said U.S. policy on Gaza will depend on Israel taking steps to reduce civilian harm and address the safety of aid workers. After that, Israel said it would increase aid deliveries to Gaza, including through Ashdod Port and the Erez Crossing, the main checkpoint in northern Gaza that Hamas attacked on October 7th closed since the beginning of the war. Israel's military says two officers have already been dismissed and it says the findings of its investigation have been passed on to military prosecutors to determine whether to open a criminal prosecution. Gail. Mm, that's interesting. Holly, before you go, does the report say why the Israelis believed, as we just heard, that they, that they thought that there were militant gunmen inside this convoy? What made them think that? Gail, it's an extremely complicated account of trucks unloading food aid at a makeshift pier, Israel's military believing that they spotted gunmen, uh, vehicles entering and then leaving a hangar, all resulting in that critical error. The bottom line is this should never have happened. Yes, we all agree with that. Holly Williams reporting from Israel, we thank you. And just moments ago, the World Central Kitchen released a statement that says in part, Without systemic change, there will be more military failures, more apologies, and more grieving families, adding, we demand the creation of an independent commission to investigate the killings of our colleagues. The IDF cannot credibly investigate its own failure in Gaza. And as Gail mentioned at the top of the show, in the phone call with Prime Minister Netanyahu, President Biden warned for the first time that U.S. support of Israel is not unconditional. Ouija Jang is at the White House. Ouija, good morning. Good morning to you, Nate. Good morning to everybody. Until now, President Biden has resisted calls for the U.S. to limit or condition military support to Israel. But in what the White House described as a candid and frank conversation, President Biden made a variety of requests from Netanyahu and called for an immediate ceasefire. President Biden requested those humanitarian corridors to Gaza be opened, 
during a tense 30-minute phone call with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, marking a sharp shift in its handling of the war in Gaza. The Biden administration now says U.S. support of Israel as it takes on Hamas is not guaranteed. If there are not changes to their approach, um, it is very likely we're going to change our approach. The White House said Biden made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by Israel's immediate action to increase the flow of humanitarian aid and to protect innocent civilians and aid workers. The risk to aid workers is unacceptable, so there has to be tangible steps. Delaware Senator Chris Coons, a close confidant of Biden's, is among a growing number of Democrats who are now open to imposing new conditions on military aid. Tell me about why this is a turning point for you and other members of Congress. I've never expressed uh, before these last few weeks a willingness to condition aid, and it is on these narrow conditions. If Netanyahu were to go ahead without making any provision uh, for getting civilians out of harm's way, for providing humanitarian aid uh, in this unique circumstance where you've got a million civilians who've relocated to Rafa because Israel told them that's where they could go safely. Um, that has reluctantly brought me to this point. The White House continues to warn Israel that a major assault on the city of Rafa would be a mistake. On the Republican side, House Speaker Mike Johnson reacted to President Biden's call with Netanyahu, posting that Biden's ultimatum should be going to Hamas as it continues to refuse to release Israeli and American hostages. Nate. Weijin, thank you. We're going to turn now to a powerful and deadly nor'easter hammering parts of New England at this very moment. Extreme winds knocked out power to hundreds of thousands across the region, and some areas saw up to a foot and a half of snow in April here. The storm also brought flooding to coastal communities. Elaine Quijano has more on this big mess. High winds, heavy snow, and flooding. The Northeast was the final target of a week-long storm with deadly results. In Derry, New Hampshire, a grandmother was killed and her 11-year-old granddaughter was injured in this house explosion. Relatives told CBS News Boston a tree fell onto a propane tank next to the home, causing the blast. The child is expected to survive. I would ask that everybody keeps the family in their thoughts as we process this tragedy. The intense nor'easter, with gusts up to 60 miles per hour, knocked out power to more than half a million customers across New England, including southern Maine, where a house in West Gardner was engulfed in flames. First responders there believe a generator was used in the garage where the fire started. In Massachusetts... We heard, like, a, a, the crack, and then it, we the whole house shook. This tree came crashing down, crushing a car in Nicole Saltzman's driveway in North Reading. On the coast, strong winds and high tide drove seawater on shore. The nasty weather also inundated downtown Boston, making ordinary business anything but routine. This is not what I was hoping for, visiting Boston for the first time. For CBS Mornings, I'm Elaine Quijano in New York. For more on those storms all across the country and the forecast for Monday's eclipse, let's bring in meteorologist Jim Cantori with our partners at the Weather Channel. Jim, good morning. Good morning, Tony. Uh, we wish it was August where we had this big subtropical ridge, but it's April, which means we have the jet stream cutting right across the United States. First things first, the nor'easter. This is our second nearly 30-inch snowfall in less than a month, and they all happen in March and April. This is crazy. We're going to stick with this thing right through Saturday afternoon, but the good news is by the time we roll into Sunday, yes, we'll have new snow cover, but we will also have mostly clear skies. I like New England for the best viewing. Out west, this is the problem. New storm comes in. It's kind of one, two pieces. It's going to move across the Intermountain region. Some of this clears the totality path kind of, may leave some clouds behind, but the new piece starts to fire up the rain down into Texas. Um, so viewing right here, right now, does not look that great, not to mention we could throw in a few thunderstorms. Right now, if you look at the forecast, remember, this is one run of one model. <sighs> That's not looking too good. This is the potential for cloud cover. Tony, where are we gonna go? Either way, buddy, make it a good weekend. Wow, that doesn't look good. People have big plans. I'm going to Indianapolis, but no, you're showing me 50-50. Uh-oh. Man, all right, Jim. Well, I'm praying. Thank you very I'll much. I'll do what have I can. Weekend. I'll do what I can. Thank you. You too, buddy. <laughs>
In other news, the lawyer for Super Bowl winner Rasheed Rice now says Rice was driving a Lamborghini involved in a high-speed hit-and-run crash nearly a week ago. Photos taken at the site appear to show Rice leaving the scene of the six-car crash in Dallas. Omar Villafranca has more. Through his attorney, Kansas City Chief star Rasheed Rice now admits he was behind the wheel of one of the cars involved in this multi-vehicle crash on Saturday. He's a young man that made a mistake. Without Rice present, his attorney held the news conference Thursday and said his client confirmed to police he was driving the Lamborghini SUV that police say was speeding alongside a Corvette. That led to a six-car chain reaction crash on Dallas's North Central Expressway. Photos obtained by TMZ Sports appear to show Rice and others walking away from the wreckage without stopping to see if anyone needed help. Two drivers were treated at the scene and two other passengers were taken to the hospital with minor injuries. Rashid was not running from anybody, trying to hide from anyone, but wanted to cooperate, which we've done. Kayla Quinn was caught up in the crash while driving home with her four-year-old son. No one, not one out of the four or five guys stopped to check on anybody. In an Instagram post on Wednesday, Rice wrote he will continue to cooperate with the necessary authorities and that he sincerely apologizes to everyone impacted. And we understand that no one can get over the memories of being in that accident. But the fact is, is that we're going to do everything within our power to do so. Dallas police are still investigating, but Rice's attorney says he expects charges to be filed soon against the chief star. For CBS Mornings, I'm Omar Villafranca in Dallas. You know, um, incidents like this is a, a microcosm of what happens in society. And I'm not saying that, say, it happens every day, so it's okay. I'm actually saying, on the contrary, that the same consequences that civilians face, professional athletes should and yeah. will face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the excuse that, oh, he's young and done with a lot of money, that doesn't fly. I just hope he and every other professional athlete learns from incidents like this because we've seen this over and over again. Remember what happened with Henry Ruggs. Oh, we do. That could happen that. again. Listen, yeah. that just falls under the young and dumb category to me. He's 23 years old. That doesn't, it certainly doesn't excuse it. I'm just glad they didn't kill themselves or someone else Everybody who else. was also It's pretty the simple road. at the end of the day. Don't race, exactly. don't run. Yeah. Exactly. A multi-million dollar burglary in Los Angeles has police looking for suspects and some answers, too. Officials say that a thief or thieves broke into a security company storage facility on Easter Sunday and stole as much as $30 million without setting off any alarms. Police Preston reports on one of the largest heists in California history. It's the plot of countless movies. $150 million without breaking a sweat. Huge sums stolen from a supposedly secure vault. And at a nondescript warehouse in Southern California's San Fernando Valley, it happened. CBS News confirms up to $30 million in cash was stolen on Easter Sunday. The discovery not made by Garda World staff until Monday morning. One employee asking not to be identified says they were stunned. They checked to make sure that the alarm is set up. So, you know, just to think that they were able to go through the security system and get away with all that money, it's a, it's a shocker. Law enforcement sources say the burglars got in through the roof of the cash storage facility. A large portion of the side of the building is now boarded up with plywood. So I think it was very planned out and very sophisticated operation. Based on my experience, this smells an inside job 100%. Moses Castillo is a former LAPD detective supervisor. He says it's likely the burglars had help from a current or former warehouse worker. How often does something like this happen? It's very seldom. It's, it's not often at all. It's a facility like this has sophisticated, advanced technology on alarm systems, and then to know how to navigate to go undetected, it had to be an inside job. The hunt is on the way for the thieves. While a joint investigation by the FBI and Los Angeles Police Department has been launched. For CBS Mornings, Elise Preston, Los Angeles. Gather round, Earthlings. We are three days away from that total solar eclipse of the heartland. And to get us all ready, we built a model solar system right here in Times Square. Nate? Grab your sunblock. It's about to get hot. Mm. Tony, check this out. Boom. Now, 
As the Earth rotates around the Sun and the Moon rotates around the Earth, they fall into alignment at least twice a year. Now, even though the Sun's diameter is about 400 times larger than the Moon, a total solar eclipse where the Moon completely covers the Sun is possible because the Sun is about 400 times farther away from Earth. Now, when you look at the sky, they both seem about the same size. Yeah. While the impact of the eclipse will be experienced across much of the country, the big show is the umbra. Love the umbra. Love the umbra. And that's when the moon completely blocks the sun. That's the total eclipse. As the shadow of the moon travels across North America, we get the path of totality. It will go from Texas to Maine and will be between 108 and 122 miles wide. That's nearly twice wow. as wide as last time. Wow, wow, wow. I yeah. am so excited. Now, on every morning of our life, you will notice that the sun rises in the east yep. and sets in the west. But the eclipse actually goes west to east mm -hmm. because you're watching the moon's shadow and orbit, not the Earth's. Yeah, and even outside of totality, it's still a pretty cool show yeah. to watch. Most of America gets the penumbra. Uh, that is partial shadow. Mm. And if you're only 30 miles from the path, you'll get what's called deep partiality. You'll see just a sliver of the sun with the sky darkening a bit. It's the difference between night and day. Mm. The farther away you are from the path, the moon will cover less of the sun. Here in New York City, we're at 90%. And if you're in the 75% area down here, only 75% of the sun will be covered. That's not bad, though. Not it's bad. still going to be a show. Now, yeah. people north of the path of totality will see the bottom of the sun covered, and people right. to the south will see the top of the sun covered. The next solar eclipse that crosses the U.S. will be in 2045. 2045. From California to Miami. That sounds like a great show, but 21 years, that is why my heart and my feet are going to be in Indianapolis on Monday. I like that.